Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to another session of Karwan Online History Festival Season 2. Today it is our greatest honor to have Professor Akhil Bilgrami sir among us this evening morning for him uh, to deliver a lecture titled Gandhiji and the Idea of Modernity. Akhil Bilgrami is an Indian philosopher of language and mind. He has been in the Department of Philosophy at Columbia University since 1985 after spending two years as an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. Professor Bill Grammy is a secularist and an atheist who advocates on understanding of the community oriented dimension of religion. For Bill Grammy, spiritual yearning are not only understandable but also supremely human. He has argued in many essays that our modern world in our modern world, religion is not primarily a matter of belief and doctrine, but about the sense of community and shared values it provides in contexts where other forms of solidarity, such as strong labor movement, are missing. Sir, it is a great honor to have you, and it is a total fanboy moment for me to have you and to moderate this session this evening. So without further ado, I would like to give this floor to Professor Bilgrami for the lecture, and then we'll move to a conversation and we'll take some questions from the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. So um, Sean has asked me to, to speak about uh, Gandhi and his attitudes uh, towards modernity and I think it might be a good idea to begin first I'd like to to say something right at the outset about how I understand uh, the term modernity and how I think it ought to be used uh, I, you see modernity as as a bit of nomenclature uh, emerged not merely to speak about a long period in history, <clears throat> but uh, so it didn't just denote a temporal span, uh, but it's essentially a, a, a term to talk about certain developments in politics, governance, and political economy. Uh, certain characteristics and features uh, in these areas. And so it's full of content. It's not just a term to describe uh, uh, a span of time um, in, in historical evolution, but, but it is contentful. It describes certain developments uh, in these areas of politics and political economy. And uh, and as a result, uh, we can't just see it as a, a neutral term uh, in which all sorts of a rag bag of contents uh, uh, can just be uh, accommodated in that temporal uh, span. So it has a very specific set of contentful commitments, modernity. Now, one of the things that is very important to stress is that when you've got a contentful term like that, and not a neutral term just describing a period of time, then uh, which contents get stressed are, have got to be the most dominant trends in politics and political economy of the time. Uh, in any period of time, there 
there's going to be a dominant trend, and then there are going to be a range of marginal or dissenting tr trends. It would be absurd to say that the term modernity is a rag bag to describe both the dominant trends and the dissenting and marginal trends, because that would make it a completely contentless and uh, 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 empty term just to describe a period of time, which is what I'm resisting. So terms like modernity are really there to describe a certain predominance of a certain ideological set of developments in politics, governance, and political economy. And the dominating element is the doctrine of what came to be called liberalism. Uh, this is a had a whole set of theoretical developments from people like John Stuart Mill, I mean, from John Locke to John Stuart, through John Stuart Mill, uh, down to the present time, figures like John Rawls and so on. That's the theoretical part. And then in, in actual politics and political economy, it was the dominating trends were uh, liberal governance, liberal democratic uh, ideas uh, uh, eventually consolidated and codified in constitutions and uh, and political economy uh, the standard economic formation that accompanied liberal democratic societies was um, uh, the capitalist <coughs> uh, structures that uh, formed a, a unique economic formation in the modern period. So terms like modernity, terms like the enlightenment and so on are in a sense, slightly self-congratulatory terms to emphasize the uh, sense of achievement in these uh, political and economic formations, that these political and economic formations were normatively uh, uh, proposed. Uh, they were theoretically con uh, consolidated in, in theories such as the social contract. Uh, and these were seen as modern political and moral achievements. Uh, so that's what I mean by self self congratulatory uh, terms like modernity, and that's how you've got to see the term modernity. Now, when it comes to Gandhi and Gandhi's opposed to modernity, it would be absurd to think that what he's opposed to is a span of time. What he's opposed to is the dominant trends in a particular place where the term modernity began to be used as a self-description, the term political enlightenment it was used as a self-description, the term enlightenment was used as a self-description of the modern period. Uh, and so Gandhi is opposed to a, se a set of contents, of political and economic contents that dominated the period from roughly the mid 17th century on. Now, so that's that's a very important point that he was he was really opposed to to certain political and economic ideas that were dominant in a particular period. Now, if I'm right about just this elementary terminological point about how to use the term modernity, then if what I'm doing is basically refusing the idea that modernity is a rag bag in which you have dominating trends as well as the dissenting trends. So my way of reading Gandhi's opposition to modernity is to see him as basically implicitly in an alliance with the dissenting trends in Europe 
and the rest, what he liked to call the rest, generally. That is, if you define modernity and the Enlightenment and so on in terms of these dominant liberal trends uh, in politics and political economy and governance and so on, and not as a ragbag, then you've got a whole lot of dissenting voices in Europe itself uh, in the area and time of modernity, con contentful time of modernity. And, and, uh, and so you can see Gandhi's opposition to modernity as in a sense allied with the dissenting trends uh, rather than the dominant trends, dissenting against the dominant trends in Europe itself. And that is what I've tried to do. And in some of my work, I've actually even seen him as, as uh, in some ways, having affinity with Marx, uh, who was a dissenting voice. So, so for me, you can't see modernity as including Marx and a whole lot of dissenting voices. Uh, these were dissenters from modernity. And Marx, in my view, was basically, primarily, uh, a romantic thinker. Um, uh, and romanticism is often viewed as uh, an opposition, a counter to the Enlightenment. Okay, so so that's a, a very brief initial terminological sermon, uh, which is essential to understanding Gandhi's opposition to modernity. And, and it's been a, a lot of my work on Gandhi has been to see him as having alliances with dissenting voices as a result of this terminological insistence on my part with uh, voices, dissenting voices in the West or in, in Europe. Now, <clears throat> one of the things you find very often, even amongst <clears throat> progressive readings of Gandhi, I mean, even left-wing readings of Gandhi, very, a very um, standard reading of him, is to, to see Hinswaraj, which is his major work. I mean, it is his, uh, it is his one single <clears throat> highly original um, theoretical piece of writing. Uh, the date is 1909. And the standard reading of him, even when it is sympathetic to him, reads that book's quite shrill anti-modernism, anti-modernity, uh, as being a sort of reactionary Gandhi. And, and then the sympathetic reading sees him as withdrawing from the reactionary position he took in, in Hind Swaraj in 1909, over the next three decades, uh, where he was educated into more progressive ideas, more progressive ideals, as a result of his experience of leading this long, amazing uh, national movement over the next few decades. Now, uh, so, so the standard reading says that's the reactionary Gandhi in 1909. He's opposed to modernity and so on. But slowly he gets educated through experience of, of leading a, a national movement into more progressive ideas. Now, I think that th that's, that reading is, doesn't really understand his, his political motives very well. And, and I think it is not really, in the end, a very sympathetic reading of his political ideas. <clears throat> I think, therefore, what, what I have tried to do in my work is to, is to ask the question, can we see something progressive in Gandhi's anti-modernity, anti-modernism? That is, can we read Hinswaraj as itself a progressive text rather than the reactionary text from which he then departed over the next few decades. So really what I'm asking is, is can you see 
progressive ideas in the anti-modernism. Now that might seem like a contradiction, self-contradiction. How can you, how can you, uh, since progress means accepting modernity and giving up the past, how can you have uh, progressive ideas in your anti-modernism? Um, well, I don't care about the word progressive. If, if the word progressive uh, suggests that you, you can't possibly be anti-modern by definition, you can't be anti-modern and be progressive, I'm happy to drop the use of the word progressive, accept that and say, let's use the word radical instead. Uh, and I don't mean radical in some uh, highly general and omnibus sense where um, uh, radical means just attacking everything at the roots, you know, all sorts of uh, 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 terrible doctrines like fascism are radical in that sense. <clears throat> what I mean is by radical is just the standard idea of radical, as you find it in left-wing politics, uh, left-wing politics understands itself as a radical politics. That's what I mean by radical. Um, and I want to ask, therefore, is there a left-wing Gandhi, a radical Gandhi in that sense, in the anti-modern Gandhi? And I'm resisting the standard reading, which says, is there a left-wing or radical Gandhi, despite the anti-modern Gandhi? which is what uh, many leftists uh, read Gandhi as saying. So, so that, and, and, I, and I think that you can pursue this idea that there is a radical Gandhi in Gandhi's anti-modernism anti if you understand <clears throat> the fact that his anti-modernism has alliances or serious affinities with radical dissenting voices all through the modern, the post 17th century period in Europe. In fact, if you look at what he read, um, uh, people like Ruskin and Thoreau and so on who influenced him, these are dissenting voices in, uh, uh, in the West. Um, so, uh, so now the question is, which dissenting voices does one see him as having affinities with, such that one can read his anti-modernism as being radical? Um, and in some of my work, I've actually seen serious affinities with Marx, though by no means uh, 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 a total affinity with Marx since Gandhi was not a revolutionary socialist by any means. In fact, Gandhi did not even understand properly the concept of class. Uh, so, so in many ways they are very different, but the differences are very well known. The differences have been widely, widely stressed by many writers, uh, both uh, Gandhi admirers and Gandhi detractors. So, so Acknowledging that there are many differences between Gandhi and Marx, I nevertheless have tried to read him as having serious affinities with Marx. Now, one final methodological point that I want to stress is that it's to ask the question, why do people resist this idea that there might be a radical Gandhi a left-wing Gandhi in the anti-modern Gandhi, in the anti-modern, in his anti-modern ideas. I think they, they take that view because they, they cannot see that many of the dissenting ideas in the West were ideas that still have a lot of importance for India in 1909 when Gandhi was writing in Swaraj. You see, one of the assumptions that people often make and which makes them blind to the idea that Hind Swaraj might be a radical book, uh, radical in the left-wing sense of radical, 
is that there is a kind of telos or teleology uh, such that uh, what happened, say, in 17th century Europe uh, is such that what we are landed with now in Europe, that is uh, what, what might be called late modernity in Europe, is inevitable as a telos from what started in the 17th century in the incipient modernity that emerged in the middle of the 17th century. That means silencing the dissenting voices. That means saying the dissenting voices just are irrelevant. So all we have is the inevitability of what happened in the uh, uh, in the developments in Europe from early to late modernity that we are in right now in Europe, say. And, and I want to argue that there is no telos. Uh, and Gandhi certainly didn't believe that there was any telos. So the way I read Gandhi is that in 1909, when he was writing in Swaraj, he was, he saw India implicitly. He saw India as being at the crossroads that Europe was in, in early modernity, in the 17th century. And it, there's something perfectly reasonable about reading Hind Suraj that way. That is, he thought India was at the cusp of modern developments modern developments that were being imposed on it by its colonial masters. In, and he said, let's follow the dissenters from those developments rather than accept those developments and pursue the path from early to late modernity uh, that Europe has seen. Because he was against the, the contentful developments from early to late modernity in Europe, capitalism and its effects on human mentality and human social life. He was against the details of liberal political governance. Uh, and he was explicit about all that. So, so in that sense, he liked the dissenters were, uh, was opposed to modernity. And if, the, if you see the dissenters as radical, which they were, I mean, if you take somebody like the 17th century dissenters, the, the radical Puritans who stressed uh, the ideas of popular religion, which were to a large extent egalitarian and communitarian. Uh, and uh, if you stress Marx, uh, especially his ideas on alienation, um, you'll see that there are serious affinities with Gandhi's ideas. So, so that's one way in which I see him as a radical. He has the same radicalism in 1909 for India that many of the dissenting voices in Europe uh, for over the two, two centuries from mid 17th century onwards had. Uh, and you would only deny that this is radical if you thought that these dissenting voices lost out in history, so they couldn't possibly be significant uh, for India in 1909. Well, that's telos, that's teleological. Gandhi was not, didn't see anything teleologically inevitable about the developments uh, of uh, modernity. All right, so so th those are the large frameworking points uh, uh, that I want to, to situate Gandhi in. So let me now talk in some detail about why I think his ideas are radical uh, in the sense that I've framework in these uh, foregoing remarks. Now you see, one way to think about it is to, is to notice that <clears throat> 
people might be quite appalled and in fact see this as reactionary, uh, Gandhi never stressed modern ideals of liberty and equality. And a great deal of uh, liberalism uh, is based on a foundational commitment to the ideals of liberty and equality. And they never figured in any substantial, serious sense in Gandhi's political philosophy. So you might see this, I mean, one standard way of seeing it is to say, well, that's part of why he's reactionary. He never uh, cherished these two great ideals. He never made them central to his political philosophy. Well, notice that neither did Marx. Marx, in fact, was much more explicit than Gandhi. Gandhi merely was indifferent to these ideals. He never stressed them. But Marx actually dismissed them as bourgeois ideals. Uh, if you read on the Jewish question, famous essay of Marx, uh, it's a brilliant critique of ideals of liberty and equality, as enshrined in rights and so on and so forth. So, so that's a seriously detailed, substantial uh, set of affinities with Marx, the failure to stress liberty and equality. Now, of course, there are differences. Why did Marx not stress liberty and equality? Because Marx thought that liberty and equality were so frameworked that you couldn't realize them jointly. I think Gandhi in many places says similar things. That is, if you take liberty to be what it means by liberalism, then by its nature, it seems to to promote inequalities. So there's a tension between the commitment to liberty and equality, and that's the heart of liberalism. And both Gandhi and Marx were puzzled and therefore dismissive of both ideas because they saw that in modernity, that is in liberal, in, in a period of time dominated by liberalism and capitalism, it was the nature of liberty that if you took it seriously, it undermined the aspiration to equality. And that is everywhere true in the developments of modernity. In fact, it culminated in a spectacular tension between liberty and equality during the Cold War, with one side accusing the other of promoting liberty at the cost of equality and vice versa. The other side, vice versa. That's a that's a, just a crude uh, manifestation of what were theoretical developments in which liberty was so theorized and methodologically developed that it was in the nature of liberty to undermine equality. Uh, and this was by attaching liberty to the possession of private property. This was by the attaching of liberty to notions of, of, uh, of, desert, um, that is rewarding talent, and uh, which promoted inequalities and so on. Uh, so, so there were serious features of, in the theoretical developments, uh, in which two ideals, great ideals were articulated, but were theorized in such a way that they were in tension with one another. And Gandhi and Marx, therefore, just removed liberty and equality from the center stage of their political philosophies as a result. And, um, and that's one very detailed affinity between Gandhi and Marx. And, and, I, and I think that's part of Gandhi's radicalism. And how to develop that has been uh, uh, a detailed concern of mine in my writings on Gandhi. Let me then add to, to this particular affinity. Uh, having said that this is an affinity, and you know, in, in order to just spell this out briefly, one, one more point about this 
uh, if I I mention a, uh, another aspect which might which is qualification of what I just said. Uh, in my reading of Marx, I stress not just the early Marx, uh, primarily the economic and philosophical manuscripts, but also the very late Marx, which is not often studied by Marxist scholars. And that is the Marx in the last decade of his life, um, when he learned Russian and had a very elaborate set of what I call ethnological notebooks, in which he argued <clears throat> that countries like Russia, uh, um, this is talking about it in the second half of the 19th century, uh, countries like Russia and even India, India is mentioned there, there's a critique of Henry Maine and others, um, the, the countries like that need not go through the, the long incubation of, of modern industrialized capitalism that Europe went through, that there could be a path to a revolutionary socialism that finessed, that bypassed <coughs> that incubation uh, that Europe went through. And so in my reading, I stress the very late Marx and the early Marx and try to read uh, the Marx in between, which is the Marx that almost everybody uh, stresses. And you know, it's got very powerful analysis of capital, so you can't fail to stress it. But if you, even if you stress it, if you read it, keeping in mind the very early and very late Marx, you get to see a Marx who has much greater affinities with Gandhi or the other way around. Gandhi has much greater affinities with Marx if Marx is read this way. And, and I think it is uh, surely the right way to read Marx and it only got ignored because of, well, because of, of a whole range of theoretical uh, interpretations, uh, the most dominant, which was Althusser's, but I'm not gonna get into that now. All right, so uh, having said that, there's one qualification I want to make here. And, and I'm not, well, it's not exactly a qualification, but here is a way of, of insisting on reading Marx in this way is to find in Gandhi a, a way of understanding uh, a point in Marx, which is very central to Marx, uh, Marx's analysis of capital in, in this long so-called middle period. Uh, and if you see what I've been saying, <clears throat> you can see Gandhi as having, in a way, a reading of Marx, or even if you like, a critique of, of Marx, uh, which is quite illuminating and insightful when it comes to understanding the colonized countries like India. Here's what I mean, and, and this is uh, one way to, to think about Gandhi's anti-modernism as radical. You see, a lot of people, stress an aspect of Gandhi, which is seen as a moral point. By moral, I mean a normative point, that things ought to be a certain way. Uh, and Gandhi certainly did say things like, like the following. Uh, Gandhi understood that there was, in the modern period, a great deal of criticism of superstition, of religion, of caste, um, and uh, uh, hierarchies of various kinds, divisions of various kinds, which we sum up in crude omnibus labels such as feudalism. And these consisted, the, the defects of this period consisted of primordial ties which induced hierarchies um, and oppressive uh, social features. 
caste domination and so on, uh, religious divisions, etc. Now, uh, Gandhi often said, he always acknowledged that these were defects, these, prim these hierarchies owing to primordial ties, caste, religion, etc. He always acknowledged that there were defects in this. But he made the moral, moralistic or normative point that we should overcome these defects. There are defects and we should overcome them, but we shouldn't do it by destroying the communities of a pre-capitalist, pre-modern form that exist in village life. And in this, he was certainly very different from Marx. Because Marx is absolutely clear. If you read chapter, if you read part eight of, of Capital, it, there's a there's a long discussion of his idea of primitive accumulation. And there is, uh, in particular, in uh, chapter 27, there's a, a discussion, a, a very interesting and illuminating discussion of a particular form that primitive accumulation took, which is the uh, enclosures movement in England and then Europe, the rest of Europe. Now, it was a standard reading of Marx, Marx's idea of primitive accumulation, is this. Uh, in modernity, pre-capitalist communities are transformed by capitalism into uh, 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 undermined pre-capitalist communities and, and the hierarchical ties or uh, hierarchical features owing to primordial ties are undermined by modern developments of capital uh, and new forms of community are formed which are communities of solidarity between workers in, in uh, uh, urban industrialized uh, uh, society. So this is part of the historical evolution uh, of progress from uh, feudalism to capitalism. And primitive accumulation plays a major role in that. What is primitive accumulation? Primitive accumulation is is basically the transformation of peasant societies, societies with, with local communitarian artisanal uh, um, communities into modern industrialized labor. And now modern industrialized labor for Marx had its own uh, defects uh, of alienation of exploitation of labor and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, it was for Marx, a transformation of the primordial ties to a new set of, of uh, uh, new understanding of what communities are, modern communities. And so the old hierarchies and the old primordial ties are undermined, new things emerge, some of which are, are very bad. Uh, because they're exploitative of, of, of labor and, and so on and so forth, and this creation of unemployment or the reserve army of the unemployed and so on, all those are bad things. But nevertheless, they're not the old bad things, the new bad things. And the old bad things die out as a result of this kind of primitive accumulation in which uh, petty producers, primarily peasants, but artisans too and so on, they... Uh, you know, they, they are dispossessed of their means of living and livelihood, land, dispossessed of their land for creating the new growth economies <clears throat> uh, based on industry, mining, 
um, and so on. Uh, metropolitan development, urban development. So, uh, and the standard pattern is that the agrarian life gives rise to agri uh, agrarian economies, give rise to agricultural surpluses which feed into cities, in the creation of cities, new forms of labor emerge, etc. Now, for Marx, therefore, getting over the old hierarchies, feudal hierarchies, and the primordial ties on which they were based, getting rid of them through these historical developments, through primitive accumulation, dispossession of, of petty producers from their means of production, like land and so on, <clears throat> uh, that's the path to getting over the hierarchies of the old order. Uh, for Gandhi, the real, he insists that that's not the right way to remove the defects of feudal society, the primordial ties, the hierarchies that, that emerge from those ties. For him, they should be addressed, the, those defects should be addressed and countered without morphing into these new class formations uh, through industrialized metropolitan development. That's Gandhi's normative moral point. That, that's a bad development, he says. He says that repeatedly and it's familiar. Now, that's a difference between them. But now, what I want to argue is that that has, a, has to be read properly. In my view, it is not just a moral point. It is not just a moralistic point against developments of metropolitan urban um, uh, social life as a result of uh, capitalist development and primitive accumulation. I think you have to understand Gandhi's normative point as not being merely normative, but as being part of his radical anti-imperialism. It's not a sentimental normative point only. I'm not denying it's a moral point. In fact, when I made this remark in a, a lecture <clears throat> in Delhi some time ago, uh, my friend Rajan Prashad scolded me for saying, of course Gandhi was making a moral point. Why do you deny he was making a moral point? But I didn't deny he was making a moral point. I was nevertheless saying that the moral point is inflected with, it's contextualized within an anti-imperialism. Right? It can't just be seen as a self-standing autonomous moral point that you shouldn't uh, undermine old forms of, of community um, and, and form these new class formations. That's, it's not a self-standing moral point. It's a moral point which is situated in this anti-imperialism. And I think it's really important to stress that, which is what I want to do. <clears throat> um, you see, here, here's a way of understanding why Gandhi's anti-imperialism deeply informs why he makes the normative point that we oughtn't to uh, transform uh, old communities uh, through primitive accumulation, through this historical process of, in which primitive accumulation plays a central part. Let me present the this anti-imperialism as contextualizing his moralism here uh, by considering a remark of Amartya Sen's, uh, which is quite widely cited now. Amartya Sen, you remember that when, when there was uh, a widespread protest uh, <clears throat> uh, against the primitive accumulation that was occurring, uh, with these corporate projects, which the state supported in various parts, Bengal, Chhattisgarh, a whole range of places, 
uh, Singur is only the most uh, well known of, of these. Uh, that's standard primitive accumulation. Right? Corporate projects take over land, dispossess peasantry of their land. Uh, for corporate projects, the state was supporting this. Widespread protest in India. Uh, but Sen stepped in and wrote a piece in the Telegraph, which was also published in the Financial Times, in which Sen said, uh, look, India's got to go through the process of modernity. It has to go through what, for instance, he says, uh, Britain went through. Uh, Britain created its Londons and Manchesters through the process of primitive accumulation. Uh, <clears throat> and India will just have to do so too. <clears throat> he said that quite explicitly. Now, when he said that, many left-wing critics, Prabhat Patnaik and others, pointed out that, well, look, this is, this is not a good analogy. It's a, uh, he gives a historical analogy with Britain, but the analogy is completely imperfect because in Britain, when people were dispossessed uh, from quite early on for, for a very long uh, period spanning a couple of centuries, people moved when they were dispossessed of their land and means of production, many producers were dispossessed, they moved to other parts of, of the temperate belt, North America, <coughs> uh, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, South Africa. So they moved to these other parts and that was really basically the diffusion of capitalism, capital, in, to other parts of the world. And uh, And Patnaik and others pointed out to Sen that, you know, then there was this free mobility of labor, but now labor can't go to, to other parts of the world uh, because of the immigration laws. So they, it's just creating glutted cities. People are moving when they're dispossessed of the land, they just go into the cities, live in slums, they're uh, in miserable conditions and, and so on. And it's just, it, you know, it's, it's just a very bad analogy because, uh, the, uh, the mobility of global mobility of labor is just simply not possible today as it was in Britain uh, when Londons and Manchesters were created through primitive accumulation. Now, take that criticism of Sen. You can't stop there. You have to ask, okay, well, what was Gandhi thinking when he said when you spoke about India and primitive uh, uh, and, and saw the possibilities of capitalist development in India when he was against it when he was against the morphing of um, pre-capitalist communities to other class formations well one way to think of what Gandhi was thinking is to think of a counterfactual take but and others criticism of Sen Suppose, suppose, imagine a counterfactual. Suppose that the people in Europe could not go to what is now the United States and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, etc. They couldn't go to the Americas, the Antipodes, and so on, to the Cape. What if they were all forced to stay sedentary in Europe? It's a counterfactual. In fact, they went to all these places and capital got diffused. But suppose they couldn't go. Suppose they all had to stay in, in, uh, in Europe. There's millions and millions of, of I mean, you know, uh, 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 a tremendous sector of the of petty producers suppose they just was stayed sedentary in Europe. Of course, capitalism would have developed, but what would have happened to all these people? Would they have overcome their primordial ties and the hierarchies and so on? I mean, they would have always been outside 
of capitalist production. Right. So would you have had the historical developments as a result of primitive accumulation of giving up uh, hierarchies and primordial ties if, if the diffusion hadn't taken place? Okay, so that's the counterfactual in Europe. Now, what Gandhi was basically saying is that what is the counterfactual in Europe that I just elaborated, i.e. people not moving out as they in fact did, that's the counter to fact. They in fact went out uh, to other parts of the world, but counter to fact, imagine they didn't. Now that counterfactual in Europe, Gandhi was saying was the factual in India. People can't go to other parts of the world if they're displaced here, right? And to this day, they can't. Uh, so, so there is no reason to actually expect that these so-called great developments of overcoming feudal ties and so on and so forth would happen in these large agrarian e economies of the colonized South. Because what is the counterfactual in Europe is the factual in, in these agrarian societies of the South, the colonized societies of the South. So it's not just a moralistic point, but it's a moralistic point saying that imperialism, that is British and other imperialisms, do not allow for the kinds of so-called overcoming of primordial ties, etc that happened in Europe, it's not gonna happen in these, because what, what I described as the counterfactual in Europe is the factual in this, these parts of the world. So, so what Gandhi's saying you oughtn't to do is informed by the fact that it's not going to happen anyway. Right? Because it's happening depends on the possibility of this diffusion to other parts of the world. It's not going to happen. So it's not an isolated moral point. The, the point is part of his anti-imperialism that this is the blueprint for Europe is not a blueprint. It's a, it's, it, there is no, you see, so the way to read this is that Marx cannot be making a point that has any theoretical significance. There's no, generality, there's no universality, there's no telos, there's no theory in Marx saying what he said about primitive accumulation. It's not a theoretical point, it's, it's just an empirical observation about Europe, that as it happened, purely as an empirical development, when people were dispossessed through primitive accumulation of their means of production, land, etc. They went off to these other parts of the world in Europe. And so you could get over the primordial ties and hierarchies of feudalism, etc. through primitive accumulation. But none of that is got any generality. There's no theory there. It's just a local observation about Europe. It's a totally local observation about Europe. You can't read into Marx some theoretical point about the inevitable historical telos by which these developments are going to take place and primordial ties are going to be overcome and hierarchies of the old form are going to be overcome. There's no reason to think that Marx had any right to make a point of any generality. It is an, only an observation of what happened in Europe. I see that as the only way to read the significance of Patnaik's and others' criticism of sin. You've got to read that. But if you read that in this way, then you can see that Gandhi's anti-imperialism was lying behind his moralism. Imperialism doesn't make possible for the colonized lands, the kinds of things that happened only in Europe for very contingent, Uh, due to very contingent circumstances, which are not replicable in other parts 
of the world, especially the colonized agrarian large societies of the sun. Okay, so, so that's the sense in which I think that if you, if you read Gandhi this way, I mean, if you read Marx in these ways, and, and to do that, you have to stress the early and very late Marx, then Marx is not making a point about some large historical development that's got to take place in every part of the world, which is what Sen is assuming in a way. It's nothing of the kind. Marx is making no theoretical point there. He's making a purely empirical point. By theoretical, I mean a point that is generalizable. He's only making an observation about what happened in Europe, not to be generalized, not to be made into some theoretical uh, configuration, which applies to other parts of the world automatically, not at all. So, so in that sense, if you read Marx as not having a telos of any kind there, then it, it follows that there's something very shrewd about Gandhi's moral point that you oughtn't to, to seek to overcome the defects of, of traditional societies by seeking necessarily a transformation of this kind, which is not going to uh, mimic Europe because the circumstances are very different and imperialism has made the circumstances very different. All right, so in that sense, <clears throat> I'm saying if you read Marx that way, Gandhi is completely at one with Marx along the lines that I've been suggesting to see him as having a dissenting voice. But as I said, they are, uh, 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 many differences as well because, you know, uh, So, for instance, the one main difference is that Gandhi thought that in his very late work, he argued that countries like Russia and um, India needn't, needn't go through capitalism in order to, to, to make for a transformation through revolutionary socialism. Gandhi was not a revolutionary socialist, so uh, that's a real difference between them, and nobody can deny that. So the real affinities with Marx are, that I've stressed so far, are that he is, uh, Gandhi is, uh, has affinities with the Marx read along certain lines, saying that what is true of Europe simply cannot be true, and we have to find other ways of developing politics and political economy in countries like India. And in a way, I think uh, Mao saw that too, whatever you think of how things actually developed in China under Mao. Mao had a similar general orientation as Gandhi did and this reading of Marx uh, that I'm proposing. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much time there is, Ishan. I'm going to speak, uh, oh, I have some more. Going to speak for another 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> so, so part of what I want to, to stress there is that the anti-modernism in, in Gandhi is just a shrewd understanding that Europe is, is not and therefore ought not to be replicable uh, and replicated in other parts of the world, unlike what Sen was saying. Now, um, there's one large other point that I, I can stress. There's so many points to stress uh, about what makes his anti-modernism uh, possible to read as, as a radicalism. But here's uh, the, the other part that, that I, I want to, to stress. And, and that is, When I said that Gandhi never stressed liberty and equality, uh, and neither did Marx, what is it that Gandhi uh, 
and Marx stressed, but that they share as a stress if they didn't stress liberty and equality. Well, my view is that what they did stress is a much more human idea than liberty and equality. Uh, a more ageless idea, but they had different sources for that idea. But it was the same idea in both Marx and Gandhi. For them, what was central to politics and political economy is not liberty and equality for both of them, for neither of them. But for Gandhi, as a result of his understanding of popular religion and his understanding of what he wanted to channel from popular religion into local communities and in particular ashram life <clears throat> uh, and what Marx on the other hand wanted to get this more fundamental idea I haven't, I haven't told you what the fundamental idea is yet, but, but, but I'm about to. But I'm trying to say that their sources are very different. Uh, Gandhi got its source from, from popular religion, community, local communities, ashram life, and so on. For, for Marx, it was interestingly, because he was speaking about a very different kind of society than Gandhi was in, in 1909 in India, speaking about relatively advanced industrial societies for him this ideal was to be found in the solidarities of labor labor movements labor unions and so on and this is the idea of living together in an unalienated way so in my work i've called it the unalienated life which is basically for Marx, you overcome alienation through the solidarities of trade union life, of unions, labor, uh, and labor movements and labor solidarities as a class solidarity. For Gandhi, as I said, it was the ideal of ashram life, the ideal of agrarian communities, the idea of the dignity of labor, of work, um, laboring together cooperatively in ashrams, in, in uh, cooperatives. And, uh, and the idea was, these are social sources of being unalienated. Now, the term alienation, the term of overcoming alienation, of being unalienated, these are highly theorized by many, many political philosophers and theorists. In the West, the most famous of them is uh, initially Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, early Marx. And in, in uh, countries of the South, Gandhi is a very prominent figure uh, in, in stressing the unalienated life, though, as I said, the sources are different. And so we have to ask the question, what is it that they're stressing? What is it to be unalienated? Why should you stress it more than liberty and equality? Now, I'm not going to be able to tell you a very complex uh, set of arguments I've tried to give in my work, in which I argue that liberty and equality would be far more interesting notions that, than they are in, in liberalism. If you see them as secondary to and necessary conditions for this other ideal of a uh, more fundamental ideal in Marx and Gandhi of the unalienated life. I'm not gonna be able to do that, but I want to just give you a sense of what I mean by the unalienated life which in a very abstract form is shared by Gandhi and Marx, despite the fact that they come to it from very different sources. For Marx, 
networks through labor uh, relations and for Gandhi through popular religion and ashram ideals and so on. How shall we characterize alienation, overcoming alienation or being unalienated as the most fundamental goal of politics for both Marx and Gandhi? What is it <clears throat> for them? How do we characterize it in a way that is more, is abstract and general enough that Marx and Gandhi can be said to share this idea as being the basic goal of politics, despite the differences, sources from which they get it. And I, I, I'd really like to, to persuade you of what it is that they share, which is a radical idea, I think, and part of Gandhi's radicalism, which is Marx's radicalism. <clears throat> See, all of modernity is said by all these theorists of alienation to, to be characterized by alienation. Modern social relations, modern economic relations, <clears throat> for a whole range of thinkers from Rousseau to Sartre uh, and Gandhi, um, is characterized by alienation. So they all sought to describe its overcoming, the idea of an unalienated life. And my way of, of theoretically defining what alienation is, it's one way of doing it. There are lots of ways of doing it. But one way of doing it is as follows. <clears throat> and I'd really like to be able to convince you of this. See, it's an essential part of the mentality of modernity as it's contentfully characterized in terms of liberal democracy with its individualism and so on, individual freedoms, etc., and the capitalist political economic, but capitalist formation, economic formation that accompanies it. It's an essential part of the mentality. And Gandhi, by the way, was, was Marx was interested in the, in the underlying economic structures of capitalism. Gandhi didn't analyze that with, with in any detail, but he was at least as shrewd, if not more shrewd, about understanding the effects on the mentality and the, the societal relations uh, of capitalism as Marx. Uh, he was very insightful about the, the cognitive, the moral, cultural effects of capitalism as Marx was, even if he didn't under, under, analyze the, the economic structures uh, with the same care and, and knowledge and because he wasn't living in an in, in industrial uh, capitalist society, industrialized capitalist society. So he couldn't analyze that in the same way. Anyway, coming back to the question, how can we characterize at an abstract and general level what Marx and Gandhi share when they say that the most fundamental goal of politics should be uh, not liberty and equality, but a more human ideal, which is the unalienated life? Well, to understand what they mean at this more general level uh, together, you must understand the mentality, as I said, that underlies capitalist economic development and the political ideals of individual liberty, etc., that it generates. My way of doing it is to is to stress uh, the ideology underlying the political that the most basic ideology underlying the political economy of liberalism. The, the greatest, the, the most deep commitments of liberalism and as a philosophy that consolidates the capitalist economic formation 
is an argument which is often described as an argument within game theory of uh, the tragedy of the commons. So if you go back to the question I raised about primitive accumulation, the privatization of land, which was in the 17th century, it was, there were extensive commons, say in Britain, let's just take Britain. There were extensive commons in which people, just like the forests, where the foresters live, uh, in, in India to this day, um, there were extensive commons, and those commons through the enclosures, which is what Marx studies, many studies the primitive accumulation in chapter 27, those uh, commons were privatized through the enclosures. Now, the privatization of the commons has been theoretically consolidated through a whole range of theories, social contract theories, which I've written about. But what underlies all of it is a, a, a cognitive mentality, which is roughly this. If agrarian living requires, uh, if, if agrarian living were not privatized, it would consist of something like the commons. In fact, cooperatives, ashram life, etc., are often can be seen as local ways of talking about the commons. Now, the mentality of, of liberalism all for 250 years has argued that to have a commons in which there's living together cultivating together uh, the, say land cultivating or grazing together if it's pastoral uh, it's grazing if it's uh, agricultural it's cultivation the underlying ideology of of, of uh, liberalism and the capitalism it, it justifies and consolidates is you can't have a collective cultivation of the commons because it requires everybody to pay the cost of collective cultivation, cooperate. But you can, you, that's not a realizable idea. And the reason is you can't realize it is that cooperation is not a rational thing. It is not rational according to this mentality of, of liberalism and capitalism. It's not rational to pay the cost of cooperation to cultivate the commons as a collective. It's not rational to do it. Why not? And here's where is the crucial point about alienation. It's not possible to do it because in the end, everybody is always anxious. Every individual is anxious that if I pay the cost of cooperation, but others don't, I will lose out. All sorts of things go into arguments for privatization and so on. But this is an anxiety which is everywhere present in the thinking that goes into liberalism as it justifies capitalist economic formations. It's there in, at the heart of, the underlying heart of, of liberal thinking is nobody can be sure. This is why it's, it's a game theoretic idea. It's like a multi-person prisoner's dilemma. No individual, can be sure that others will be cooperating and paying the cost of cooperation. No individual can be sure of that. And if others don't cooperate, 
whereas and I cooperate, I will lose out the worst. If everybody cooperates, everybody gains. There's no denying that. But I as an individual, you as an individual, she as an individual, none of us can be sure that the others are cooperating. So it makes no sense for me to cooperate because if I cooperate and you don't and others don't, I will be the worse off. So it makes no sense, it makes no rational sense for anybody to cooperate. But of course, if everybody thinks with that mentality, then the commons are destroyed. It's called the tragedy of the commons. If nobody cooperates, everybody's in it for themselves, the commons are destroyed. So the argument is, look, this is hopeless. There's going to be the tragedy of the commons. Everybody's driven by the anxiety that cooperation, paying the cost of cooperation is irrational because you can't be sure that others are. So forget about the cultivation of the commons collectively, privatize the land, get all the standard developments of capitalist ideals. That's the deepest bit of mentality that underlies the arguments for capitalism. And now, why have I been stressing this? Because it is Gandhi's point that that way of thinking, that mentality, which gives rise to the anxiety what if I cooperated? What if I paid the cost of cooperation, but others didn't? That's a real anxiety that's driving this argument for capitalism and privatization. He says that anxiety is a sign that we are alienated. If you're unalienated, that anxiety would never occur to us. It would not. It, it won't occur to us to be anxious that others are not cooperating. It's only if you're alienated that we think, oh, but he might not be cooperating, so I better not cooperate. Only in an alienated society could you think that. So if you want to know the, the most general definition of being unalienated, here it is. You're unalienated if that thought never occurs to you. What if I cooperated and others didn't? The thought, the deepest underlying thought that drives capitalist political ideology never occurs to a person. And Gandhi explicitly said that anxiety never occurs in ashram life. No member of an ashram is anxious about it. What if I cooperated and others did? He says, it's, it's just not part of a whole range of popular religious ideals, community ideals, and so on and so forth in traditional agrarian life. It's just simply not part of it. And that's exactly what Marx has, uh, uh, too, you just, these thoughts never occur to you. Again, this is not a moralistic point. He's not against self-interest. I mean, he may be against self-interest, but this is not the same point as being against self-interest. It's not a moral point against self-interest. Rather, if you're unalienated, the thought never occurs to you. So it's really an epistemological point. Everything that drives capital, I think the underlying mentality is this idea, this anxiety, what if I cooperate with others? But the real ideal of unalienatedness is that if you are unalienated, this, this thought, which is the underlying anxiety that drives capitalist rationality, is simply outside the horizon of one's mentality and thinking. That's what Gandhi understood by ashram life and so on. And in that sense, he was very deeply opposed to the thinking that underlies modern economic formations and so on. Okay, I'm going to stop now and take questions. I'm sorry I've gone on too long.
thank you very much sir for this very interesting lecture and very deep lecture that uh, that has given us food for thought and much to read about gandhi that has uh, you know that we have to in in these times so to begin with the conversation the first question would be how do you judge the relevance of gandhi it's it's a very common question but it has to be answered i think in these times that how do you judge the relevance of gandhi in 21st century india um well uh it's a very large question and there's so many aspects to gandhi's thinking uh that one just has to be selective and and uh you know one of the things that a lot of people think that a lot uh, uh, gandhi's ideas are are some idyllic village life and um not very relevant to to modern developments in political economy and so on uh one place to begin to think about this is to notice and people have been doing this uh but it's only i, I don't think that you see it, it, um it's important not to to do this in the wrong way but one way that immediately comes to mind is that gandhi was far ahead of everybody when it came to questions of the environment right now questions of the environment are in everybody's mind right everybody is convinced that the environment is one of the or the most fundamental threats to all of the globe not just india but all of the globe uh gandhi's ideas on this are so far ahead of others right i mean at the time he was writing about this that everybody says oh but if he had followed what gandhi was thinking then it would be very different and you know no serious in what ideology of the environment can now deny that the people who are thinking in the most sensible perceptive way about the environment are actually indigenous communities in many different parts of the world indigenous communities so australia and canada and in north america and uh are, are thinking have always thought about the environment in a now it's it's a very interesting thing that uh the left for a long time i mean remember i i grew up in uh as a young leftist in the 60s uh and none of us then took the environment seriously nobody in the left i mean not in india as a college kid not in oxford when i was in england i uh, nobody was taking the environment seriously for a very simple reason the left never took it as a fundamental and serious problem to think about the welfare of future generations it was not part of the left's horizon right they were admirably honorably thinking about poverty in different parts of the world and all that that was very much driving and it's very honorable motivation for leftist thinking all through the period when i was um thinking uh when i was part of you know broadly intellectual left it's only relatively recently that the left has taken up environmentalist uh, uh because of the crisis that that is now one of the things and so so you see that here the left is finally catching up with gandhi's ideas on this front but I, the reason why i say that you can't misunderstand this you can't you shouldn't understand this wrongly is that you can't understand environmental issues without understanding the whole framework of the political economy of capitalism no serious person thinks that that you can address the environmental crisis today without addressing capitalism 
It's impossible. You know, there are lots of people who say, oh, no, no, the Soviet Union was just as bad about, about the environment. So, so you can't just keep stressing capitalism. But you see, the point is that undermine that that is to say destroying the the environment is built into capitalism right it's part of the the telos and trajectory of capitalism it's not part of the telos and trajectory of, of socialism it isn't that the Soviet Union was was uh, had economic policies that were very, hard, very harmful to the is a contingent fact about how socialism development in the Soviet Union and and behind the Iron Curtain. But anybody who who thinks that who equates socialism with the Soviet Union never took socialism seriously in the first place. Uh, so so the point is that it's it's very much part of Gandhi's anti-capitalism that uh, that is anti that is environmentalist ideal are very much part of part of his the anti-capitalism that I've been stressing okay so uh, so that's one way in into seeing his relevance everybody sees his relevance once you bring that in and if you see that as requiring a fundamental critique of capitalism it to address the environment may you have to may have to bring capital to a terminus, right? I mean, people like Naomi Klein and all have been very clear about this, and they are the only serious uh, environmentalists around. You know, all the others are just tinkering with it. You know, all these agreements, Paris agreements, it's a joke. None, none of that's going to make any difference. Okay, so that's one obvious relevance of Gandhi. And it's not a sequestered, isolated thing, the environment. It's part of a general critique of capital. So, so Gandhi is very much central to that. But now if you look, you see, it's very interesting to see, to ask the question, why did Gandhi's ideas, even about political economy, not take hold in India? It's, it's really interesting to see this. You see, even as, late, even as early as the late 30s, I think it was in the late 30s, Nehru set up a, a sort of early planning commission, um, a proto planning commission, uh, in, in the late 30s. And the, there was one person who had, who had Gandhian ideas in that commission, that was Kumarappa. He was just completely sidelined. Right? I mean, Nehru and others were already seeking out this uh, emulation of, of the Soviet model, you know, which they then began to. And that was right from the start. Uh, somebody like Kumarappa was was basically a laughing stock in that, and he just he just withdrew and, and left, it's saying that this is hopeless. It's uh, so from quite early on, well before independence, the Congress Party's high command was was sidelining Gandhian ideas about development. You know, sort of local agrarian development. If you industrialize, it is through the needs that emerge from the bottom up rather than you know imposed by the state right from the outset in the way that uh that the soviet model that and you know as a result of this early sidelining of these ideas you find that the only person who opposed nehru in the parliamentary field was somebody like charan singh who you know stood for the peasantry was arguing against nehru's ideas but it was very much part of the right wing you know capitalist oriented stress on on uh, the landed classes you know in uh, uh, amongst the uh, the peasantry and in the countryside and it the, the Gandhian ideals never took and so Charan Singh with his relatively right-wing capitalist ideals that stressed the peasantry over the was the only alternative so why wasn't there a third view I mean, you had somebody like Charan Singh on the one hand, and Nehru, of course, the dominant uh, uh, figure. There was no third alternative. It never developed, right? And it's not obvious that it sh uh, why it shouldn't have developed. It, it was an obvious way of, of presenting a third view, but it never was allowed to happen. Now, the question is, is it still relevant? Of course, it's still relevant. I mean, if the fact is, 
To say it's irrelevant is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're going to destroy the planet. You're going, you know, you're going to have no, absolutely no instruments to counter capitalism if you say if you say it's irrelevant. Saying it's irrelevant is not an option because it's just a self-fulfilling prophecy that not only will you make it impossible for ordinary people to live a sane life of, of uh, relatively egalitarian uh, ideals in relatively egalitarian ideals, but you'll destroy the planet. So I think it's to, to say that Gandhi may not is, is not relevant to the present times is just a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is which sees its way to seeing capitalism as inevitable and seeing the destruction of the planet as inevitable. Uh, so this is a question from Prakriti Anand. Uh, you have written an essay that Gandhi is a philosopher. So if we encounter a number of self-proclaimed Gandhians and those who constantly bring out the aspects which are criticized in political and historical arenas, between Gandhi as a Mahatma and Gandhi as a supporter of orthodox Hinduism, what characteristics of Gandhi need to be highlighted in popular imagination and history writing? as far as you are concerned. How do you think on this? Well, I'm not a Gandhian. You know, I, I, I wouldn't call myself a Gandhian. I wouldn't call myself a Marxist. I mean, these are, uh, uh, I mean, I don't think that one should uh, hitch one's thinking to any one person. Um, but so, you know, I really refuse to see myself as an apologist of everything Gandhi said. In fact, I remember when a friend of mine, uh, uh, Pankaj Mishra, wrote to me after Perry Anderson's uh, articles and books came out criticizing Gandhi, saying, you have to reply. I, I'm not going to bother to reply to. <clears throat> to In any case, it was a very sloppy invective uh, by Perry Anderson. But I'm not, so you shouldn't, see me, I mean, you should tell this person who asked the question, I, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to present anything as a Gandhian or an apology for Gandhi in any respect. Uh, Gandhi, Gandhi's claim that he was an orthodox Hindu is a completely perverse claim on his part because nothing about his Hinduism was orthodox. Absolutely nothing about his Hinduism was orthodox. It was an extremely maverick Hinduism. After all, it's the orthodox uh, uh, Hindus, or at least the people who claim to to be the the messengers of orthodox Hinduism, who killed him. How could he possibly be seen as a so uh, so? His claim that he was an orthodox Hindu is just a totally perverse claim. And Gandhi Gandhi said a lot of things in order to make sure that he had the support of everybody during the national movement. Uh, and uh, uh, did similar things in Africa too. So, uh, you know, to get support, he was not prepared to alienate many people. So he said all sorts of things which were, uh, which seem completely perverse, but they were very tactical moves. And um, I don't, I mean, I just think it's its completely wrong to think he was an Orthodox Hindu. His own claim to it was totally perverse. Well, so this question is by Muskan Jain, that in spite of Gandhi's contribution to the making of modern India, why does he continue to remain a controversial figure in public imagination? Uh, there are narratives that he was for the partition so what makes the current trend of anti-Gandhian ideology flourish, especially in India, in these days? But how could anybody say he was in favor of the partition? He may have been the only leader who was not in favor of the partition. I mean, that's completely wrong. I'm sorry that uh, he was, he may be the only major leader who was opposed to the partition. I mean, don't forget that a great deal of, of the, the move to partition that made it inevitable was 
and this is something that Perry Anderson simply doesn't un understand. I mean, it's just so strange. Uh, uh, his reading of that period uh, is, look, one of the things that made partition inevitable was that even if you take the view that Jinnah, which many supporters of Jinnah do, uh, and I think they're right, that Jinnah was not really wanting a partition, that he did not want uh, an independent state, uh, Muslim state called Pakistan, uh, and that he was only developing all that um, in order to to bargain for uh, serious provincial autonomy, you know, for the Muslim majority populated regions, uh, and for a federal system that was, you know, had strong uh, regional autonomy, provincial autonomy. Uh, well, uh, let's say that's right. The Jinnah was was not in favor of partition himself, and he wanted to use the idea of Pakistan merely as a bargaining weapon, right? This is what people say, and Asha Jalal has established that with some scholarly depth, Sirwai too, and others, and uh, Walt Burton all. Now, um, even if that's true, ask the question, who in the Indian leadership was opposed to that? Provincial autonomy. Well. It wasn't Gandhi. I mean, Gandhi was, wasn't the one who opposed that. The one who opposed that really was Nehru. And, and why did Nehru oppose it? See, this is something that I don't understand. Nehru opposed it because he had his, what may, you know, what the left very often thinks are perfectly honorable reasons for opposing it. One was, there are two reasons that Nehru had for opposing it. One was, that Nehru really didn't think that if you had the kind of strong provincial autonomy that Jinnah wanted, that you could get rid of the princes. Nehru was convinced that there was no way to get rid of the princes if you granted so much provincial autonomy. Right? And he thought, this is no way to continue with the uh, you know, feudal. Yeah, he was, in that sense, he wanted a modern India and he didn't want uh, he wanted immediately to get rid of the princes as soon as possible. The second reason was that, that Nehru wanted serious central planning. And you couldn't have that unless you had a strong center. Right? So the kind of provincial autonomy that Jinnah wanted was just not going, it was not compatible with it. And Perry Anderson, who everywhere is committed to that kind of, of leftism, which has central you know, he, he doesn't even mention that in his analysis. Just really, you know, you, you, it's such a sloppy and ignorant uh, understanding of the motives that went under. It doesn't even mention this as a, a motivation. So, 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 I mean, what is a leftist writing about it which doesn't understand the simple motivation? Now, Gandhi was didn't want a strong center. He never was in favor of, of that economic model. And, you know, so he was he was the one person who was against partition, right? Who was who was quite willing. In fact, as you know, he made that flamboyant, romanticist gesture of saying, "Let let uh, Jinnah be the prime minister," and so on. And you know, um, so so it's really quite wrong to say that he was uh, against partition. He was the one leader who was very clearly against it. Yeah, uh, but uh, there are some, you know, the some anti-Gandhian ideologies flourishing, it seems, in India. How do you see that? Some very anti um, say that again? Anti-Gandhi, you know, against the ideology of Gandhi, well, which, the values of Gandhi. Which ideology, Gandhi? See, what is certainly true is that, that all of this right-wing Hindu nationalism is against Gandhi. It's absolutely true. Uh, Gandhi, uh, for all his talk about his Hinduism and so on, his Hinduism was precisely the Hinduism that the Hindu right-wing nationalists hated. Um, 
right? I mean, openly, openly, all the all the Hindu Hindutva people say that he he made Hinduism into some emasculated uh, uh, religion, and and uh, you know, uh, uh, in, so so clearly that's one reason why uh, his view is rejected is because Hindu nationalism is dominant today and and Gandhi's Hinduism is precisely deeply opposed to Hindu nationalism. In fact, whatever Gandhi's Hinduism is, it's precisely the Hinduism that Hindu nationalism rejects. Uh, the other uh, anti-Gandhi uh, trend today is, is the is the predominant neoliberal capital which stresses precisely all of these uh, features that I've spoken to you for more than an hour about, um, which accepts the entire mentality uh, that I think was made. So, uh, so all of my lectures precisely been to say that it is these aspects of Gandhi, the anti-capitalist mentality uh, that is widely accepted by, I mean, it's not just uh, Narendra Modi and his government, it's, it goes back to Manmohan Singh and the changes that took place in 1990. In fact, even before, uh, I would say, uh, in the entire Rajiv Gandhi period onwards, uh, there was a kind of Congress party that was, you know, everything was around Delhi and it lost its grassroots completely. and. Uh, it wasn't the grassroots Congress party that Gandhi uh, and to some extent Nehru had, uh, had presided over. But it's, it's, you know, one of the things to stress is that it may very well be that, that despite having led a movement in which Kisans were at the forefront of the national movement, the Congress party did not lay deep roots in the peasantry. It did not. It was, that is why it was so easy to completely deracinate itself from that grassroots, uh, starting with Rajiv Gandhi's governments onwards. And of course, after 1990, it was just clear that globalization was uh, going to undermine all grassroots, but it started earlier with, with the emergency, post-emergency period. Yes. yes. Uh, so uh, there's a question from Chanda Singh in the live chat that what about the cultural ethos of India? Was it under threat even at Gandhi's time? And what were his views on it? Now, you see, one of the things I did say that it wasn't uh, it, it, it didn't lay as deep roots in the peasantry as uh, uh, as one might have expected, given that it was a peasant-led, uh, it was a peasant mobilization primarily that the, the national movement was. <clears throat> I mean, you know, if it if it had laid deep roots uh, in the early period, you wouldn't have had to have the kind of horrible authoritarian state response to the peasant movements of the 60s and early 70s. You know, the real state authoritarianism that was unleashed in the 60s and early 70s against the, uh, the peasant rebellions, you know, in Lakshabari, Tarangana, and so on, these, these, the state really came through as being totally outside of the peasant ethos uh, uh, and the peasant dissatisfactions. It was, you know, really outside external authoritarian uh, response to it. It's a clear sign that that the Congress Party hadn't laid deep roots. Now, this question by Chanda Singh about the cultural ethos. You see, there's a tendency to think that people like Modi, etc., are just the an outgrowth of the. Mahasabhite element that started in the 20s and was in fact very much part of the Congress Party. Don't forget the Congress Party had a very strong Mahasabhite element. You know, if you if you ask the question, how was how was 
why was Urdu given up, for instance, right? Uh, mostly, I mean, all, all questions of Urdu really, UP is the center of <clears throat> uh, location for asking those questions. But why did people like Sampoon and Tandan and all that manage to completely uh, defeat Nehru on the question of Urdu? And uh, uh, well, you know, it's because of the Congress had a strong mass of identity. Uh, you know, Patel and Pant were also sort of part of it I mean, uh, to some extent. And and uh, but that, I mean, my response to Chandra Singh's uh, question is, I don't think it's right to see the right-wing Hindu nationalism of today as having its roots in uh, those uh, elements, the Mahasabite elements. And I mean, there were the Mahasabite elements in the Congress. There was, of course, Savarkar and, and Govarkar and pe people like that, but those were not the roots of Narendra Modi. I, I think, I, I keep saying this in, in my lectures and writings, I think historians need to make a distinction between roots and antecedents. Yes. And you can have antecedents, you can have unresolved questions as a result, but to say that, that the roots of, of current Hindutva uh, nationalism is to suggest that there's a causal, organic causal path from those early 20s Mahasabite features to Narendra Modi, nobody's shown that. I think that the real rise of the central domination began of the Hindutva um, movement began in the 80s for reasons that are peculiar to the 80s. I don't think that that uh, ethos it defined the national movement by any means. Those were marginal uh, elements during the national movement. There's no doubt that Gandhi and Nehru dominated the national movement. So we'll quickly take two more questions before we end this session. Uh, this is a question from Mithila Biniwale that how would you like to locate Nehru's idea in context of Gandhi and Marx as many times Gandhian ideas are, were captured to gain support of masses by the state to promote Nehruvian idea of modern develop, development? Well, yeah, so, so my remarks about how as early as the late 1930s in that forum that Nehru had organized uh, as a sort of proto-planning thing, Gandhian ideas were sidelined. I mean, if you just look at Kumarapa's, how Kumarapa was treated, how he responded with despair to what was going on, it is absolutely clear that Gandhian ideas were, were not taken seriously. And my remark about how, as a result, you only have the kind of opposition, the dichotomy between Charan Singh and, and Nehru, uh, Mahanabha's ideas and so on, that became, that exhausted the options right, Nehru versus Charan Singh, if you like, putting it very crudely indeed, uh, is just a sign that that uh, Gandhi's ideas on development and so on were never taken seriously um, from the late 1930s, uh, certainly and in, after independence. Uh, but, but I do think that, that there is a misunderstanding uh, about the differences between Nehru and Gandhi on a quite different front. And, and that is on secularism. I, I think Nehru and Gandhi had very similar ideas about secularism. And, uh, and as I've argued in, in some of my writings, neither Nehru nor Gandhi believed in secularism or talked very much about secularism uh, almost throughout the, the national movement. Even Nehru uh, never stressed secularism um, until, you know, until virtually the period of partition and the acrimonies around partition were obviously made secularism come up as a topic. But secularism was not a topic until after independence. And of course, it's an obsessive topic since the 80s because of the rise of Hindutva. Um, but secularism was, was not something that Gandhi and Nehru, either of them, neither of them, not even Nehru, stressed secularism through the national movement. And I've written about this. Uh, 
And there, so there was no real disagreement between them. Yes. Uh, so I think there can no better question than this to end the session that how do the youth connect with Gandhi in this capitalist world? The, you know, the ideologies and the values that Gandhi, you know, wrote about or followed. How can the youth connect with that in this how world? Can youth? How can yeah, the youth? Yeah how, yeah, how can the youth connect with Gandhi and ideology and the values in, these, in this world? Well, you know, one of the things that was very impressive during these uh, uh, youth uh, protests against uh, uh, the government's actions on this citizenship stuff was very impressive. Was I, I think it was very much part of Gandhi's understanding um, of of the mix of popular religion and ideals of citizenship and so on. In fact, in fact, I believe, I mean, this is an interesting thing. I, I think I wrote about this in an opinion piece in, the, in Outlook uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, which I can refer uh, you to. Uh, see, I think the youth movement of the last you know, it's been aborted as a result of this pandemic, but but what we saw in the winter, this youth uh, movement in the streets and the maidans, uh, it went beyond Gandhi. You see, because Gandhi really did not think that you could combine co abstract constitutional commitments of citizenship, which he was never very sympathetic to, he did not think you could combine those with the kind of creative, popular, religious. You know, if you if you look at the the youth, they were they were citing all sorts of popular religious uh, uh, sentiments, bhakti sentiments, Sufi sentiments, poetry, art. You know, this was all coming from the kind of populist. Uh, elements that Gandhi mobilized in his movements. But Gandhi made a dichotomy between that and those movements part and this popular religious elements which he was tapping for the movement and the constitutional things. But these young people in the maidans and the streets actually combined them. Right? They, they, were, they did not see this as a dichotomy. In fact, I think it's in, in, the, in the 21st century, they have made an advance on any of these. Uh, uh, Gandhi rejected the constitutional parliamentary uh, ideals of citizenship and so on as being important to an independent India. Nehru, of course, saw all that as important. And he saw in his discovery of India, he saw this populist element and, you know, the the pluralism of India as important. But he thought even he had a dichotomy. For him, they, these were two different things. He, he saw good on both sides, and but he never brought them together. It's the youth were remarkable in bringing them together, and I think it is probably the basis of a new political theory, um, and it's up to them to forge it. Uh, is this combination of the abstract, propositional, constitutional uh, codifications and proposals? And the populist element of uh, of the Bhakti Sufi, you know, syncretist uh, uh, creative side, to bring these together is not something that either Nehru or Gandhi achieved. Uh, so the youth have gone beyond the the past political leaders, and they've done it without a leader. They've done it without a vanguard, and uh, and so. A lot depends on how that has developed once human community is restored after this pandemic. Yeah. So I think it was one of the best lectures that we had because it is a time, it is a need of the hour to, you know, to analyze and to understand what Gandhi was and to really see what the relevance of Gandhi is in this time and how we can implement those values to make a better future for ourselves in the nation, especially a nation which is very young 
uh, because we are going to be the youngest nation in the world by the end of 2020, as the study suggests. So thank you very much, Professor Vilgrami, for taking out time for this in, for this interaction. And I think this was very valuable for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Bye-bye. Bye, sir.